Um, this series on uh, the healing, healing uh, uh, arts, healing expressive therapies, it depends on what you want to call it. Some people call it expressive therapies, some people call it healing through the arts, but it really means the same thing. Um, our guest tonight is uh, Beth Ferris, and she's an um, MFA. She is a co-founder of uh, the Living Arts Program, uh, which uses expressive therapies, expressive arts, to uncover your unconscious feelings about grief, about your journey through life, and uh, about serious illness. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Beth. I'm Mary from Hospice of Missoula. I'm the grief therapist at Hospice of Missoula. And um, I have brought, uh, Beth brought her brochures for the Living Arts. Plus, there's some pens there if you want to grab and paper underneath if you want to take any notes. Uh, there's some paper there. And then she's going to talk a little about um, Living Arts, and it's been around for 20 years. It's a very <coughs> successful nonprofit, and it's helped a lot of women. I personally have had several friends that have a couple of them that aren't here right now with us that went through Living Arts to process their grief about what's next with their health journey. So basically, um, it's, it's a wonderful way to reflect on your life. In hospice, we call it life review. And so instead of through narrative therapy, talk, 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 it's through symbolic therapy. And we at um, Hospice of Missoula use expressive therapies all the time in grief work. After rapport is built with somebody, and if it's a long-term time that you see someone, then we work through expressive therapy. So I'm going to hand it over to Beth Ferris, and she's going to talk about um, the origins of Living Arts, um, its reach in the community, and she's also going to talk or, or read from an excerpt of a book that she wrote with one of the co-founders. And I also want to introduce Tracy Pondorf, who, um, without whom we would not be surviving right now. Um, even though we started 20 years ago, it's never stopped being a struggle because we don't, we know how much it costs to be sick, especially to have cancer, and we don't charge for it. And people say, well, you'd, you'd have plenty of money if you just charged. We said, no, <laughs> that we're not going to. Um, so, what? Sorry to interrupt. If you could just speak up, this fan is. Like I'm. Do we have a microphone running. up here? You know, I have a cold, so I don't know how. Oh, okay. I don't know how loudly I'm even speaking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So 20 years ago, <laughs> um, I was one of four women who started um, Living Art, and we all had various reasons that we came together. Um, one of us, Yupa Stein, had just gotten her registered drama therapy degree. One of us was dying of spinal cancer. Another one um, is, is an art therapist. And um, I have, I still have a chronic illness. And so I really wanted to do something that um, made a difference because I couldn't do anything that I'd done before. Um, so, so we believe, and it's been borne out for all these years, that um, creative expression helps us remember our wholeness, and and we use the word healing as in wholeness, and it's the etymology of that word to heal, it means to make whole. And so, so we also um, believe that, um, that awareness 
can be cultivated through art and that awareness to this now, to the, this now instead of then or what's going to happen in the future, um, helps us to remain open to all the possibilities um, that may occur. I mean, the good possibilities as well as the bad ones, but we're in the present instead of somewhere else. Um, so the first eight years, we pretty much served only cancer survivors. And then in uh, about 2000, we started working with all kinds of different illnesses and grief and bereavement. Um, our mission is to use... Hi. Of course. Let me move it. I'll move it. Okay. Just with it. <laughs> to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, our mission is to use the arts and nature to promote healing um, and to promote connection through expression. <coughs> So what we find in these workshops is, as they run f for eight to ten weeks, that the connections and the bonds that people make give, them, give the participants courage to go farther. So for instance, if someone writes a poem about childhood abuse, I mean, I mean, whatever is coming up because of their illness, um, then the next person is not terrified to say in her writing or in her painting or in her mask making what her life really is. So um, there's kind of a lack of community generally. I don't know if you all feel that, but it seems that way in our culture. And we're creating these little communities. Um, uh, we do have a handout, or two handouts. Um, and we now have three different programs. And one is a Saturday workshop for people, anyone facing illness and loss. And we, can, we have more information on our website. And I'm assuming the website is there. Uh, we we um, have met with many of our friends that we've made through Living Art at the end of their lives. But the story that I want to share with you is particularly intimate. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you an excerpt from this book. Um, we met this woman that the story is about Pamela Kirov in 1998. She had been president of the Idaho Lung Association. And she'd had breast cancer in Boise and had come back here to be with her family. <clears throat> and uh, she took a few <laughs> workshops, I mean, literally <laughs> several. And then, I mean, little did we know that she would end up as co-director of Living Art, which was um, wonderful because she was so, so precisely detail-oriented and could do a lot of the things like ask for money that we hated to do and that we didn't really feel comfortable doing. Of course, now we have to. But <laughs> then, you know, then was then. Um, it also is a good example of how uh, we as caregivers, I guess we became caregivers, um, used the expressive arts to help ourselves. Because, I mean, this woman was, at, you know, everybody's dear, dear friend. And it's not like we hadn't been with other people. I think one thing about our group is that we don't just say, OK, bye, um, if, which is often what happens with doctors. But we, 
we go with people. I mean, if they want us with them when they're dying, we are there. Um, but this was different. This was, this was um, more intimate. Um, so Pamela appeared as we were contemplating applying for our own nonprofit status. A breast cancer survivor, former executive of the Idaho Lung Association, she was returning to Missoula to be close to her daughter and grandchildren. So Pamela and I were sitting on these high stools at a tiny cafe drinking lattes, and Pamela's presence, in spite of the unusual dose of caffeine for me, was calming. Um, she laughed when I began to spread out my papers, and it was a laugh that said, oh yeah, I'm one of those paper people too. Um, so we were in the middle of trying to decide on a tagline and a stationary logo, and she immediately honed in on one, and it was a picture of a mask with light, light shining through the eyes, and, she, and it said, to heal is to make whole. And Pamela said, I like that. It says what you're about. So she immediately got us, and um, we embraced her intelligence and passion and courage. She was um, a photographer. She was, um, she did play the guitar. I don't know if she'd like being called a musician, but she was. She loved writing poetry. She loved nature. And she ended up giving retreats at Flathead Lake for several years. Um, <clears throat> for eight years, Yupa and Pamela were co-directors of our nonprofit, Living Art of Montana. Um, and and we, we wondered what it was that, that made her so committed to living art. So this is a little, little piece about um, me feeling that commitment and, and kind of answering that question. Um, I can still feel Pamela's warmth next to me as we sat at the sushi bar drinking plum wine. We went deeper into stories we'd never revealed to each other. Pamela told me about a period of time when she simply curled into a fetal position on her floor and didn't get up. She'd lost a breast to surgery, but then the, lo the love of her life after helping her through the hardest part of treatment left her. Her strength and practicality ebbed away. I asked her, what made you get up? And she said, I just got tired of crying. <laughs> And that was Pamela. Um, she told us over time that she learned to view her illness um, and as a, quote, new path. And this is what she wrote. After I was first diagnosed with breast cancer in 1993, my life was eaten up by treatment. I just put one foot in front of the other in a blur of doctors, radiation, chemotherapy, fatigue, nausea, while trying to find the strength to go to work. I began to realize something was missing with this regime. The old life was gone, yet how could I connect with this new life? That is the choice. You can continue to just slog through the days trying to recapture the past, or you can learn to create a different life. The living art experience offers a way beyond illness into that who am I really question. This is powerful because it takes you out of the anxiety of illness into the excitement of a whole new realm inside of you waiting to be explored. So the initial writing of this book um, is woven into Pamela's death, in, and I'll just do a little bit of that here. Um, Pamela, in 2004, had a recurrence, which metastasized by 2005 to her bones. 
Um, she'd already weathered 13 years of recurrences and treatment for breast cancer. And we watched her stumble and then right herself, step back and not assume the worst. I asked her how she was able to do this, and she answered, I'm trying to stay in the present. You never know com what's coming up anyway, do you? When Sheila Larson, a past workshop participant, and I first began the initial stages of writing our book, we wanted nothing more than to complete it for Pamela, to hand it to her as a gift. But the winter of, 19, of 2006 did not look promising. It was a harsh winter. In February, the pipes in my house, which always froze, froze, and we put a hairdryer on the pipes and continued writing. We wrote with hope and anxiety and fear as the cancer twined through Pamela's delicate bones. There was no time to give her even a rough manuscript. Um, she didn't seem cogent enough to read what had been writ written. We all slipped into the unsorted nature of time that grief engenders. By early March, Pamela lay on a portable bed in her living room, surrounded by her sister Sandra, her daughter Abigail, and several close, close friends. Um, Kate Lickfin, who some of you may know, was like a second sister. Of course, we all felt like her sister by then. Other friends came and went, but a core of us stayed on. The cancer metastasis and medication dissipated her consciousness, and we couldn't tell how aware she was of what was going on, but we did feel her physical ties to the world thin. Sometimes we sang, Sometimes we lay on the small bed with her, whispered in her ear, stroked her hair. We chatted with the hospice nurse as she adjusted the drug dosage. And in between visits to Pamela's bedside, I would race back to my house with, to meet Sheila and to write. We were at that point trying to write a book of prose poems, and, and the book turned out not to be just poems, but um, but in any case, this is, this is the poem that Sheila wrote on the first day of spring. It's called The First Day of Spring. Five days silent now, you'd gone to see Pamela wrapped in a freezing wind. I was left alone to beg, please don't die on the first day of spring. That's an excerpt. Pamela died the next day on the 22nd of March, 2006. So we were negotiating an inner terrain where all we could do was follow our own advice, write your way out of this. Here's something we wrote at that time. How can we think there is no further consolation? You have nudged us out of time into another time where we are forever like a prayer. Of course there was no way out. But there was the continuous word, poem, meaning, connection. We lost Pamela, but our connection to her continued in our writing and in the poems that came to us. The material body was gone, but in the poems we wrote, we held her essence. If we were true to our relationships, we will fail neither the living nor the dead. In July, we celebrated Pamela's birthday in the orchard behind her house. We lay on our back on a, that hot day and watched the hills sort of echo the heat. Um, we ate chocolate <laughs> and, and um, her grandchildren well, I guess, I guess the poem tells about her grandchildren, so I won't go on. But um, this, this is a collaborative poem, which we often write. And there are eight collaborators, and we assembled it into this poem. Murmur in the orchard, your birthday four months after your death, apples severed from the trees, ripe with bees.
We spread the quilt in shade where blue prag where blue prayer flags dangle from the trees like leaves turning in the sky. Blue, blue, blue. Who knows to do on who knows what to do on this afternoon? Your grandson holds a perfect hexagon crystal to his eye and twirls it until he is dizzy and bored. He and his sister eat lemon cookies and run off to pick cherries from your trees. We've been told to write. We'll write about you, about the wind ruffling our papers, about the dark chocolate in gold wrappers, about the view of smooth summer hills trembling in the heat about the birds in the orchard who have returned to the exact same place to build their nests year after year. Birdsong, sweetie, sweetie, the consolation of that song. Yes, I live. Yes, I die. Words on a page looking for a key to the locked box we lie back and watch the wind dabble its fingers in clouds and spread our memories across the sky. You are time now, after time has cut its swath through each of us. That, that's the poem. What is lost and what cannot be taken away? Many people make up the heart of living art but some are alive and some are not living. Our, our community is infused with what we share and what we learn from each other. Poetry, movement, warmth, kindness, shared acts of compassion make transformation possible, make survival of grief possible. The spirit transcends the physical boundaries. Living art is about living and how we help each other do that, no matter where we are on the continuum of living and dying. So this is the last thing I'm going to read, and it's a poem that Sheila and I wrote called The Gift. Each of us is born with different longings, losses, disappointments. Your laugh filled a certain emptiness at the sushi restaurant over plum wine. Consolation, delicate and firm, I saw you as a traveler going on ahead. Today we visit you at an unknown destination. Birds descend before morning and clear the dark away. This is your gift, unseen bird to bring us to the present, to teach us to stay. That's the Pamela part. <laughs> That's really beautiful. Mm, thank you. Very beautiful. It's really um, uh, expressive therapies in living art, which is expressive therapies. Um, a really neat way to bridge the unconscious with the conscious. Because so much of our life, you know, by the age six, we're already programmed. We've got a set of beliefs. That's why the army would say, or the Jesuits would say, give me your kid till six years old, <laughs> and we'll have them for life. So it's really neat to explore um, life with expressive therapies, and especially um, with living art. Um, to be able to explore your loss, whatever it is, because life and loss are married together. And we're always assimilating over and over and over again, um, and uh, integrating, assimilating and integrating, and assimilating and integrating, so that we can just carry on. And so it's, it's a delicate walk, a delicate balance between the unconscious and the conscious, because a lot of people that come in for for grief work, and I think that you probably agree that they're just, they really don't know what's going on. They're confused, they're lost, they've lost someone, they just had an illness. So to have a vehicle to express you know, who you are, it's a way of understanding the roadmap of your unconscious. And if you really look at what is your unconscious, to 
there's a lot of theories about it, but there is an intelligence that's way bigger than the cognitive brain. And if you look at it, it took two single cells to come together to create what? 100,000 cells in your body, 100, a trillion cells, 100 trillion cells in your body. And each of those cells has an organ that represents the body. It's totally reflective of the body. So each cell's got a digestive system, an endocrine system, an exoskeleton system, a digestive system. I think there's eight of them, eight, eight types. So each one represents your body of those trillion cells. And it's a booming, if you just were to drop into your body, it's a booming metropolis of cells communicating to each other. So when we're able to go down through something other than co our cognitions, and through language that has limitations unless you get into metaphor or simile, um, you're able to really understand thyself, know thyself. You're understanding, oh, this is my roadmap to my heart, the language of my heart. And so that's what the beauty of living art is. is and personally, to have witnessed a couple of my friends going through living art, it was, it was huge them to process their end of life. Any thoughts? Any reflections on? Do, are you all familiar with uh, expressive therapies? If you go to a psych psychologist, you know, you can talk, 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 talk. And a lot of times, um, it's like the dog eating its tail, right? You're just talking about I don't know what we're talking about, you know. But this is a way for you to get through the talking, to say, you know, something happened to me and I'm grieving and I don't know where it is inside of me. And I don't even know what it looks like. I just feel it right here. Because our emotions are part of our body. So if you got hurt a long time ago, it just didn't drift away. You integrated into your body. And if you don't understand it, it lives in your body as maybe a little heart murmur or a little pain in your chest when you see somebody or you think of something. So the neat thing is to go down there and to explore it through symbols because what does what is the language of the unconscious? <coughs> symbology. And only you know what that symbology means because it's all from your unconscious. And it's this intuitive reverse understanding of life. Ah, it's like aha moments. Whether you're doing it through poetry or dance or um, hot listing, hot penning, you know, it's a, it's a way to find out what's going on below the surface in that huge intelligence that's down there. Could you talk about how you would put this to use with people with dementia? Can you reach, have you done any work with people ailing who have dementia? I no, I haven't. Well, we but have this grief work. But yeah. Well, I don't know if it's grief work, but mm -hmm. um, we at hospice uh, we have these things called the snoozeland bag. The what? The snoozeland bag. And Marika, you can just you can kind of speak to this better than I can. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, snoozeland is a philosophy of care that originated out of kids who had autism. And so when they had a difficult time vocalizing mm -hmm. or thinking or feeling, or so it was used to calm them down, but also sometimes they were so introverted that they couldn't express anything at all. So it can be used in the reverse way to bring someone out. And then they discovered that that was very useful for people who had Alzheimer's as well. And what it looks like is very different depending on where you are. It can be anything from a whole room that's dedicated to snoozling where they have unique lights, you know, they might have a light show that would be in a room. And the idea is that we're going to access all of your senses, not just verbally, but to touch, to smell, to taste, to hear. And a lot of them incorporate many of those senses at the same time. So they have long, you know, uh, plastic tubing with lights inside that can be tactile. They have weighted babies you know, so they're dolls, but they're weighted with water, so that when they walk with them, it has the same soothing feeling as when they were mothers. So it depends on the person, how snoozling would work for them specifically, but it's very, very helpful as far as coming out with other creative ideas and helping someone who does have dementia. So I think that that kind of explains Do you work with Alzheimer's 
I, I've done some, yeah. I'm just curious. I'm curious about the application in the hospice setting when you're working with somebody who is has dementia. Well, um, we have found that music, and there's a lot of research backing this up, really helps. Our CNAs use it because that's they, they're the, where the rubber meets the roads with the nurses, you know, that uh, great people, they're a little bit more ethereal, you know, but where the rubber meets the roads is with the CNAs and the nurses, and especially the CNAs, and they can go in and just sing happy birthday while they're giving them a shower, and it can calm them down, or jingle bells, or something. I'm, they kind of intuit what, yeah. it might set them off to sing jingle bells, but maybe happy birthday would be a totally different thing. We're just humming. I know the interesting that. thing is that that sort of creative treatment or philosophy of care can be used instead of medication. Mm -hmm. So what we saw for many of our patients, especially with dementia, was that they were combative during bathing, and that was something that was very difficult. And so then we would give them something to calm them, but then that would be something that would make them very sleepy or tired. And then perhaps they would have increased falls, or they'd be unable to be present for the rest of the day. So to find an alternative to that, takes some creative thinking. And one of our social workers had done some research and found that in other countries, singing was specifically a very easy way to do that. And it didn't have to be that you were a vocalist and you could sing amazing songs, but something that was familiar and calming to anyone. And it was like, you are my sunshine, or happy birthday, just something that was you know, grounding. And then they didn't have to use medication. And it's incredible that we found 100% of the time that that worked instead. Mm. So to think of simple things like that. So we created snooze and lint bags that have multi-sensory things inside them and encourage everyone on our team to bring them with them, especially when they're caring for someone who has dementia, to say, you know, what would it be today that would help this person come out? So if I were a plumber, you know, we might put together a bag that had different pieces and you could fidget with all these pieces of tubing and put them together and take them apart because to me, that's what my life was and it brings me a sense of purpose. You know, it might be calming. So it can be different for everyone. And just giving people permission to think outside the box is sort of the biggest piece. Because when you know someone, that's a pretty easy thing to discover. So that's how we do it. Yeah, and, and if you, even if you have your cell phone with you or an uh, iPad, you know, sometimes you can, uh, we had this one 78 pound woman just tearing a room apart, you know, because she was agitated. And you put on George Jones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mouth and it would be like George Jones. Then he would try to play it over and over and over. He's not loving her today and she'd just be like calm oh, like she took an ad van or something. They just did a documentary called Alive Inside in the last couple of years and actually showing here now during they won a award at the Sundance. I, I was kind of a part of that when they did the Kickstarter funding and stuff, so it was really exciting to see that. What's it called? Again? It's called Alive Inside, oh. and they did the trailers, so I've still never seen the full amount because they couldn't give it to us until it went through Sundance. But um, it shows someone who's been almost like totally not responsive at all, and they're, what their premise is, if we can get a bunch of iPads with the kind of music that people need, it can almost just bring those people who are non-communicative. Some will have dementia, some are just, I don't know, have, is anyone else, has, did anyone else see it? Yeah, yeah. It's really, the man in it is yeah. just priceless. Yeah. It shows him with his daughter. There's daughters of tears saying, he doesn't recognize me, I come to see him, and he's just flat, and he's just, mm -hmm. he's just inside, it's just sad. And then um, the CNA comes along and says, I want to put your music mm -hmm. on, and he kind of, says okay and they put it on him and that man comes to life. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a light switch. Yeah. And um, in addition to singing, he's reflecting on hearing the music when his dad was there and playing it through the house and also um, he, the things he says is that the, the whole world is alive with music and what we need more is more life and more music in the world and it's just this profound statement from, from what had just been this ball of being with nothing to life. It's really incredible. I use it in some of my educations to share with people. The headphone thing yeah. is so amazing yeah. because, you know, when did we used to have headphones? Way, way back we didn't and the really, and it just does make it so much more real. It's just right there to them, right into their So is this, is this a film that's going to be on PBS? Uh, 
don't know yet. Like I say, it's here now, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping we'll get copies. Is there a chance to see it still or not? I haven't seen the schedule. I saw it was playing here. So but do you have the, do the documentary? I'm sorry, where, where was it playing? Which uh, theater? Well, they're having the, um, the festival, oh, the festival and so there was a whole list of all of those playing over the last, I think it's almost 10 days total. Maybe so online. We you can go it. online. I think the yeah. trailer's available online because somebody shared it and it was making the rounds. Yeah. yeah. That's so great. I, and you can Google it and see part of it. I really, yeah. Really Alive really inside, it. yeah. It's, a, it's very heartening, heartening. Yeah, it's really hopeful. <laughs> yes, yes. Another good movie is called Confessions of a Dutiful Daughter. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, is that the one? Oh, I know the woman who made it. Yeah, it's an incredible because it, it realizes that um, she was trying to shore her mother's life up as she's lost yeah. her memory. Tried to keep, no, you can't lose your memory. You can't throw your memory out. i got to shore you up. And then she realized in the end that she didn't need to be shored up. She ended up being um, perfectly happy not having any memories. She'd get up and dance. She'd be wearing someone else's clothes when her when her mom went to see her, or her daughter went to see her at the nursing home. But that was very good and very practical. And it was a really interesting place. This was in the Bay Area, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, it was a really interesting place where, where she <coughs> finally ended up having her mother, was that right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it was a place where if somebody, I mean, almost everybody had their own personal caregiver. Mm -hmm. If someone said, I'm going to the store, they'd say, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the person would forget. But, but they'd get to, to participate in life instead of being told to sit in a chair or whatever. And it was hilarious. I mean, if I'm thinking of the right movie where she has the cookie period. Is that the right? She has yeah. the, the suitcase period, where her mother, her mother would go through these phases, and then as she got worse, the phases sort of diminished. But it, it's very funny. Yeah, really well done. So in expressive therapies, um, there's a lot of ways that you can access that you can access it through. Um, the traditional ways of, of uh, you know, music, dance, poetry. You can hot list, you can hot pen, meaning right, you don't access your neural cortex, but you just do it in a gestalt way. Like I feel blank, 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 blank. I feel dusky, dark, round, and blue today. Or, and so someone's scribing that or you scribe that, and then you can mind map off of that. You can uh, hot pen in the sense of, do writing like a wild man or like a wild woman, because that's when you're not censoring. The best time to do that is not on line paper, mm -hmm. but on unlined paper, because you're not caught in consensual reality. You're not that little six-year-old again, trying to write your feelings down in this little box. Um, I like the one that's anger therapy, mm -hmm. because I think it, we don't have permission in this culture to be angry about someone dying or angry about a loss angry about your own diagnosis. So um, I've taken people before with 18 dozen eggs, taken them up and let them scream. <laughs> Most mm -hmm. obscene, crazy things. And I'm down at the bottom, kind of on guard, so no one comes by, you know. Or in a punching bag, or I have like a, a, a little whip in my office. Uh, not a big whip, but like those <laughs> no a noodle. A noodle, mm -hmm. and they, and you know, you have to be careful that lamps don't fall over and things mm -hmm. like that. Because when someone really feels not inhibited anymore, like I'm mad and I'm damn mad, then it really comes out. And it's so therapeutic, and then they can cry. And there's so much toxins and tears. It's not always salt and water. There's a, like the research from Dr. Fry um, in uh, Minnesota at the Dry Institute. He's been doing it for years that there's all these toxins that come out, and especially when you get in touch with um, feelings that are kind of hidden, they're not socially accepted, you know. And to have a safe place to do it, it's really important. How do we you spell Fry? F R Y. 
And that's, there's a center called the Fry Center? Yes, Dry Eye Institute in Minneapolis. He did tons of, he did tons of uh, research on tears. He collected tears of people laughing, mm -hmm. people crying, people, he, and he staged these like comics or really scary things that, like things that, that would shock the, the uh, operating system and motivate you to do tears. Uh, and then he collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of samples and he'd find that in the tears of stress and fear were these um, toxins that they find in tumors. Wow. Wow. It's a great study. Yeah. Mm. And that's combined, he talks a lot about the laughing, how laughing is important for grief. Like wild, hyena laughing. Because it, it's sending a message to your body, you're okay. You're developing a new baseline of homeostasis. And that's when you go through grief and loss, you have to develop new baselines of homeostasis. So, you know, it's beautiful form of, of therapy and having a safe setting to do it in. We run a caregivers group, and a couple of you here attended, and we were talking the other day. Uh, it was a safe setting for people to say, I'm mad, you know? I love my, my person who's terminally ill, but I'm mad that he's leaving or she's leaving eventually. Mm -hmm. I'm mad that my life has changed, that you know, they're no longer able to talk to me, and it's a safe setting. And it's really easy to say it, because we're human, and we get exhausted. And so it's such a great venue to have um, workshops where you can combine this an organism like with living art. I think I think those collective poems are really powerful because you're coming together you know, like we are. You know, instead of an individual process. One thing if we I don't know if you had an exercise in mind, but where you do the circle and you put a word in the center. Well we can do it. I've got oh. I, I brought some things up if you'd like to oh. do it. Uh, no, not, I mean, you, you said you had one. Okay. Well, I have, um, we could do both. Okay. Um, I have some magazines here, and, and I'm going to pass them around, and we're going to rip them in half. And I want you to just feel free that people go, oh, I could never rip a picture out of National Geographic. Well, I am. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> and so we are, um, oh, these are perfect for um, expressive therapy. So I'm going to pass, grab some of these around, and just, Look through it and, and um, pick a picture for grief, for your grief, or for how you conceptualize death. And, um, and then just pour, tear it out. And then I want you to grab um, some pieces of paper here, which I'll pass out. Um, T, can you help me? Yeah. Um, here's the paper right here in the pencils. Mm -hmm. And then once you once you do this, and don't, you're not in a hurry, we're not in any big hurry here. Um, just pick out whatever strikes your fancy. There can, this isn't about logic, this is about your heart. And the newest research is showing that your heart is wired from your nervous system to your brain now. Um, they used to think, oh, you're just wearing your heart on your sleeve. Well, the research now through uh, the Heart Institute is that it talks through the nervous system to you, okay? And it, it has a language unto itself, and it's real. And it's, this is um, evidence-based research. So I'm just going to um, walk around and just give you a part of the National Geographic. Or if you don't find anything, then just put them on the table. Put them on the table, and you can kind of do you want it. Um, what, what is My it? mother is uh, 86, and she was an art teacher, uh -huh. and a very craft craft person, crafty, uh, very creative, um, an artist, mm -hmm. and. I went to visit her in November and took soul collage cards and materials, oh, yeah. and I thought that would be um, a way to help her express whatever process she's in right now. I don't know if she's dying or not. Um, and she 
she didn't connect with the process of making the collages. She barely seemed to connect with what a collage was. I said, you've done collages, right, Mom? It, you know, we, we compile these. And, and um, it was very disturbing to me because that's was her world. That was my image of her identity. And if anybody has had to rework their own identity, you know, this, um, oh. so I've done that. Yeah. But here I had to rework my interesting impression of my mother's identity. And to my mind, she would be an artist and she would be uh, manipulatively creative mm -hmm. until her last breath. So being analytical, I, I thought, is she dying? Is she in the dying process and letting go of these former um, elements of her identity? They, they no longer interest her. Well, you know, the beauty of that film, Confessions of a Dutiful Daughter, it's like her mother was a, uh, a social worker. She's a professor, I believe. She was. She wanted her mother to keep her identity intact, so she was shoring her up the whole time. Like, no, Mom, I'm your daughter, I'm not your girlfriend. No, Mom, that's not, you don't dance at the doc doctor's office. No, Mom, you would have never done this. Where's your dignity? You know, she wouldn't say it that way, but she was thinking that. And then she realized at the end, when she realized her mother was going to wander, her mother was maybe going to hurt herself, fall down, but she had to put her into a home, and she looked for a while. And as I believe you were saying, she went back the next day hoping that, you know, one, just praying that her mother wasn't sitting there crying. She came back. Her mother was dancing. <laughs> she had a t-shirt on. And the end of the movie is like, she didn't have to carry all the possessions and our self-identity with her anymore. She was just, she had regrets. And why not? She was in the community, and she didn't have to shore her up at all. And I think our duty, you know, when she goes to confessions of a dutiful daughter, it's like, oh, this is how you raised me. This is who you are. This is your identity, you know? And so it was very full circle. It's a wonderful film, and uh, they show it sometimes at Village uh, Senior Residence uh, or through our caregiving group um, on Wednesdays. Yeah, but it's called <coughs> Confessions of a Dutiful Daughter, and it's so well done. It's so funny. But it really hits home the, the thing that you were talking about. Like, I love you, Mom. I love you, and I want you to be intact. And, and then her story is she, she was unraveling, and there's no way to unravel to stop that process. And actually, she wasn't burdened anymore by her ego, by her super ego, by anything. She's just childlike. No. It's hard, though. Easier said than done. Once you all find that picture of death and also your grief, I want you to take a piece of paper and I want you to just close your eyes and I'd like you to take a pencil and just write 15 feeling words. I'm sad, flat, lunar, anything's a feeling word, right? You don't have, I, Woody, Woody's a feeling word. White's a feeling word. Any any words that come to your mind. So don't don't I can see your logic going over there, Deb. I can hear your brain going like that. Feelings. The feelings. No, but anything's a feeling word. Flat, circular, round, upside down, all around, blowing out. That's a feeling word. Those are feeling words. Empty, um, dusty. You take that one picture that represents death, and you write down 15 words that represent your feelings about it. And then when you're done, then you take um, the one that represents your grief and write down 15 feeling words. And the best thing is to close your eyes, because if you're going up like this, oh, feeling words. You're trying to get this engaged and not this engaged. And really, that's where your grief lives, right in here. Right in here, right in here, right in your heart. This doesn't, this can't compute. This, that can't, this, this is saying, I can't compute what, what happened. My diagnosis, my loss, I, 
but you want to access this, this, the wisdom of your heart. And the research in heart mass says it's connected. And it is an anecdotal. It's connected to your nervous system. But you've got to get quiet, and you've got to stop accessing this part of your brain. So if you can write those down quickly, do you know what gestalt is? That means like this. 15, real fast. They don't have to make sense. You can say glasses, teeth, tongue, liquid, black, blue. Because really, that's your unconscious talking. And they don't have to be feelings. Feelings, they can just be words. Words. And write them as fast as you can. Okay, so who, who would be willing to, who would, who in here would be willing to be my first person that would share with us? Yep. Great. I'll do that. Can you show us your pictures? My pictures. This is my picture. Or what? Or, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to show you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what is it? Um, what do you think it is? What does it mean to you? What, what does it mean to me? It means sad, mad, desolate, oh. frozen, furious, mm. mobile, despair, black, red, overwhelming, alone, lost, and lonely. Okay, can you read those again? Sad, mad, desolate, frozen. Furious, immobile, despair, black, red, overwhelming, alone, lost, and lonely. Can any words repeat themselves? Alone and lonely, kind of. Okay, so that would be something that she um, knows, but her heart's also saying that I'm alone and I'm lonely. It's part of the human condition, and it's also part of her grief process, okay? So, thank you for sharing that, I appreciate it. And what's this? That's my grief. Okay, can you tell them what it is? The anger, sorrow, vulnerable, sad, excited, anxious, and what next? Hot. Hopeless and lost. Yeah. Okay, could you read them again? Anger, sorrow, vulnerable, sad, excited, anxious, what next? Hot, hopeless, and lost. Okay, any 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 words that um, any words that repeated themselves on both of them? <laughs> Combined. Lost. Sad. So, in order to understand the themes, the reoccurring theme of her look at grief and death, would be to collage then, lost and lonely. To write a paragraph like a wild woman on lost and lonely. Anything else? <laughs> I, I was not. One of my girlfriends made a mask through living art, and uh, oh my god, it was powerful before she died. And so I was just thinking of you, and I was thinking the mask that she made. She was my really close friend of mine, and I had to clean out her house, and it was just oh my god. I had to get stat disaster in there after a while, you know, because. It was like she was a bookworm and a videographer, and, but she, her masks were up on the wall, and it was her stages of grief. Hey, Mary. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out that the, this art mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. right, and I don't know if you read the article mm -hmm. about her, but this was her process. When her mom was diagnosed with well, how apropos she yeah, was with breast cancer, oh, my and how goodness. she threw herself into her art, and I think she's 15 now. 12. 12. 12. Or 12. She's 12. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was her way of processing her grief. 
I mean, her mom survived, but just the, the whole fear. These are amazing. Yeah. Boy, they tell a story. Yeah. I walked around with them last Friday when I was up here, and I was like, oh, there's a lot of different phases and mm -hmm. stages mm -hmm. here. The first one is this, you know, this black and white Arts of Pencil sketch that's the first one on the wall here. That was her first sketch that she did when her mom was diagnosed. Which one? And she had a compulsive um, hair, she pulled her hair. Oh, oh, that's right. And she drew a picture of it and then crumpled it up and threw it away. And her mom took it out of the garbage and like flattened it and that's what it is. But after she learned that she just needed something else to do with her hands, like this amazing talent sort of came about and she's really evolved. She's won awards at different shows and this is her first showing and they sold you know, two pieces when they had the first Friday. So mm. she's an amazing girl and really her mom was creative enough to give her an opportunity to find another yeah. way yeah. to really express herself. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she's still very tall. You know, I was like, let's talk about this. Like what were you feeling? She's like, I don't know. You know, she's just like, <laughs> again please okay unlimited expansion strands themes divine <coughs> opening joy beginning fear anxiety red white connection unknown colorful that you feel intuitively kind of uh, settle with each other? Uh, well, the fear and anxiety, definitely. Uh, and then open an expansion, open an expansion. So how would you look at fear and anxiety and open an expansion on a scale? Uh, how do you mean How do you, as far as a range of emotions? Where would you put, uh, with showing up with your hands, where would you put fear and anxiety, and where would you put openness and expansion? Yeah, but openness and expansion here, and fear and anxiety here. Yeah. yeah. So, if you tried to have those two talk to each other, what would be a couple words that they'd say to each other? Uh, listening and communication are the two that came up. Okay, cool. Yeah, the thing is, I have to say with this, in both these exercises, to be honest, I was surprised at the words that came up. You know, it come up, and then because you said a few times, don't think about them, because I wasn't going to put them down, because, you know, the mind kept trying to make sense of them, and of course you didn't want it to do that. And uh, so, so it's a very interesting exercise, the stuff that comes up when you try not to let your mind get into it, because it's mm -hmm. like, that doesn't make sense, well that's interesting. Uh -huh. It's another part of you talking to you. Yeah. And that's interesting that you went, oh, they, you, what did you say, communication and? And listening, yeah, and I think. Oh, two opposites, kind of like coming into the middle. And I think part of it as well is because I, you know, I 
sit with the idea of you know death a lot, and just because of different things I've done over the past, and you know whatever, um, and having been associated with hospice in the past and different things like that, it's something I I think about a lot, but not having had so, and also because of my religious practice as well, there's a sense of being okay with it, but because you know uh, I haven't encountered a chronic illness. I haven't had a terminal diagnosis myself, so there's a sense of unreality about it as well. It's like, okay, I can have my faith in all kinds of other things and have worked through other people's death a lot, so there's all of that that feels kind of interesting and big, but then the other stuff, hang on a minute, what if it's me? You know, and then I go into that state of mind and I don't know, and then some natural kind of fear is going to come up because it's like, how is it going to be with me? I don't know until I'm in that kind of, you know. So it's it's kind of tricky. So it's a, it's it's the listening on a much deeper level, and I think that's going to be hard until I'm actually personally until I'm faced with a personal diagnosis. I think there's going to be a sense of playing at it, not playing at it, but a sense of surrealness about it until I am in that position, unless I die in a car accident like that or something, you know. But that's the uh, that's part of that dichotomy as well, you see. Um, thank you for sharing that. that. That speaks to our collective conscious as well as individual, at least with me. So I think we we have those dichotomies in ourselves. Like, whoa, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you know. But that idea of listening and communication, you know, mm -hmm. the first step and how you access that. Mm -hmm. like, so, what was your grief? Okay. Okay, I'm walking around. Okay. So the grief, uh, onion, layers, sadness, loss, gray, uh, bigness, depth, why, who, next, when, depth, understanding, connection, symmetry. Can you repeat those again, please? Okay, onion, layers, sadness, loss, gray, bigness, depth, why, who, next, when, depth, understanding, connection, symmetry. That's a beautiful poem. <laughs> it really is. Mm. So, any similarities there? Well, uh, to me, the, uh, there seems much more kind of feeling stuff on the grief than the death. And a couple of the words, the words that were repeated were depth. Um, and that's because my own experience of grief and then having worked with others with grief, it's just like peeling an onion. And the other thing that came up around that as well is, when I grieve for somebody, I'm grieving for the person that died before the person that just died. So there's some of the old grief that never really gets expressed until so this person, you know, the, the current one I'm facing. So it's kind of, it's multi-layered. The thing that confused me was the symmetry. I have no idea what, yeah. that, what that means. Or I love that. that. The, the, the onion is perfect symmetry, though, on some Oh, level. I never thought of that. It's one of the patterns in nature. Oh, yeah. But that repeats so it all so over so nature. So mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh. Everything's layered. Yeah. Everything is layered. There you go. Oh, okay. Thank you, Yeah. Wow. Anyone else that would like to share? Okay. Thanks. I don't know if I'm, we should read the list, but I'm not sorry. Um, but I was surprised, or should I just read it before I comment? You can do anything you want. Okay. You're pretty free, but could I see your picture, whatever you're yes. going to come, come inside I didn't and know walk they around? It's supposed to be big. I mean, it's all right. You know? okay. that, that's kind of symbolic, Kathy. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. it's, what is this a picture of? It's a temple with people entering it. But it, is it a picture of grief or death? Well, this is uh, for death. Okay. Um, wondrous, color, blurry, open, ahead. Open, deep, many, inside, old, active, moving, directed, ancient, 
power, hypnotic. Mm -hmm. Can you read them again, please? Wondrous, color, blurry, open, ahead, open, deep, many, inside, old, active, moving, directed, ancient, power, hypnotic. Any similarities that you feel in your heart? <clears throat> well, I used open twice. Can you speak to that without getting too cognitive? Just that I feel it's like opening to the unknown. Okay. Like the ultimate journey. And this is your, can I touch this? Yes, like that? Uh, actually. <laughs> yeah, three. three. You can use that. Okay, well, I'll take both around for this one. And it's an old car, and this is an old house. Okay, she has three for grief. Old, messed up, broken, wasted, dilapidated, empty, hollow, comforting, missing, cold, numb, quiet, mm -hmm. pensive, tight, heavy. Inanimate, angry, lost. What what I found interesting was, you know, death often carries those connotations, and yet I'm carrying it under the grief. Can you read those just one more time for us? Please? Okay. And then say more about what you're saying. Old, messed up, broken, wasted dilapidated, empty, hollow, comforting, missing, cold, numb, quiet, pensive, tight, heavy, inanimate, angry, lost. So go ahead and say more about what you were just surprised about. I was, I was surprised. Um, just as you were saying that um, you wonder if like the image of death is a fantasy because you haven't had to confront your own mortality. I was surprised at how positive my feelings were toward death, but by contrast, how negative toward grief. And they were really two extremes. So say when a little really, bit more about that. But it seems like really they should be um, um, more consistent with each other rather than such a dichotomy. Any similar words on the, on the grief that you would resonate with as similar? Within grief. Within the grief yeah. words. Um, I guess quiet, numb, and cold. Whereas here, in death, it was all active and moving. Mm -hmm. so it's, sort of, it's that. just that it's surprising that you think of you would think of death as the inanimate, inanimate, cold, and unmoving. And instead, it's carried in the grief. Anything else you want to say about that? I just found it surprising. Okay. The pictures are very helpful. Any words that crossed over, Kathy? Between the two? Yeah. Um, or did you feel like they were on opposite spectrums? Old is in both. Okay. Those are powerful words, uh, the three that you mentioned, cold, numb, and quiet. That would probably be a, you know, what you're looking for with expressive therapies is to get down, to go down the rabbit hole, 
like Alice. See, who am I? You know, who am I? And so there's something very powerful in the three that, of all those 30 words she pointed out, Hello, which ones did you point out? Cold, numb, and quiet. So that'd be good uh, starting point. To how you feel yourself in the world, in the human condition, this existence. Because every time we experience a loss, or we experience um, any kind of loss, we're, we're recalibrating our life, and we're, we're assessing what is this about, and who, who am I in the big spectrum of things? Who are we as collectively as well as individually? Anyone else wants to share theirs before we kind of look at wrapping up? It's about 20 minutes to 8. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so death. These, these two are my death. Okay. Thank you. That's a that's a plastic bag that's being destroyed by bacteria. Plastic bag and, and then <laughs> a paint, a woodcut, a woodcut. And so for for death, or actually, this is uh, grief. This is grief. Okay. <clears throat> Hurts, stinging, broken, weak, alone, changes, humbled, loss, interior, tired, isolation, aching, corrosion and erosion, anxious, Family support and present, present time. Mm -hmm. Can you read those, please, again? Okay. Grief hurts, stinging, broken, weak, humbled, changes, interior, loss, tired, corrodes. Erosion, isolation, aching, crying, family support, anxious and present. Meaning now, I mean, that's it's something now. What do you feel like? Are there any similarities on your grief? Words or feelings among the, among the just those words. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean that you, that it hurts and you're broken and weak, and there's loss and it's eros erosive, corrosive, corro corrodes you. And it erodes you. And you're tired and isolated. And then for death, this, this will seem very strange. <laughs> these dresses, these little girl dresses that are that are hanging out to dry mm. Mm. Okay. in the wind, wow. and this one, bottom one. Okay, mm. I think they go together. <clears throat> um, comfort, calm individualized, brightness, transition, calm, calm twice, hope, connecting the future rather than the present, family, peace, presence, limits and limited reality, and wide open. Would you mind reading those again? Yes. Um, I'm someone who's had a near-death experience. And so I think I love the movement of those dresses and the individualized piece of those dresses. But the other one gives me the d concept of death. It gives me comfort, a calmness, it's individualized, brightness, 
transition, calm, again, hope, connecting, family, presence, future, peace, limits or limited, reality, it's wide open. So, any similarities in your list of on death? Uh, between death and grief? Well, in death first. first. Oh, in death first. I have, I notice I've calm here twice. And individualized. I think those, and maybe wide open, I don't know. But I notice in both of these I have family, and it's one of them I say present and one I say future, but I also have the word presence for death. My mother died under the care of hospice. Well, just the three that we went through, I personally saw a theme, and it, that's harder to reconcile with grief than it is to reconcile with dying. That's true. Yeah. And um, you can see that um, we're open. We might have fear, like your show, about, about ooh, <laughs> it's going to be a release, but it could be scary release. But also, but the grief seems to be um, ever present, and erosive and corrosive, quieting, numbing. Really powerful words, and good points of departure for your journal writing, for um, any collaging, uh, for conversation. You know, what does it mean to feel numb? You know, what does it mean to feel corrosive and erosive, eroding? And what does this mean in terms of being an individual as well as part of a collective whole? Because mm -hmm. that's what we are. We, we need the collective, but yet we're individuals. Could you say more about what made you summarize what you heard as easier to reconcile with grief than with death? Well. It's my subjective opinion, um, but I look for patterns in things. I'm a super sleuth for patterns. <laughs> and um, because I think the whole world represents patterns, so above, so below. You look out in the microscope, you look down in the microscope, and you look out in the telescope and you see the same pattern. <laughs> you look at a shoreline and you see it in your frost on the window. <laughs> and that's how the universe is kind of beautifully laid out in my confirmation biased world <laughs> okay but so I look at patterns in behavior patterns in myself but sometimes you can't you can't see yourself in the forest from the tree because you know the unconscious versus conscious how were you trained and what's your bells and your whistles but when you asked me that question I was came from working with people and looking at patterns sometimes I'm right sometimes I'm not but the theme it was thematic and I don't know if you heard it, but what I heard thematically was it's really hard to live with grief and the uncertainty of living with uncertainty, especially when we lose someone. There, ain't, there isn't anything uncertain except uncertainty. And we work really hard to have control in life. You know, we get our good jobs, we get a nice home. I was telling my partner the other night, I just want to get in bed, because I feel the safest in bed sometimes. You know, it's, that's, that's, managing the lack of control in our, in our lives on some level. And we do a good job of keeping control, but grief, it, it really slaps us up. Because it's under the radar. It's is kind it, of a weird emotion. Isn't it also that we really know what grief is, but we don't know what death is? Yeah, probably. That's a nice perspective to put on it. Could you say that again? I couldn't quite. That we do know what grief is. Uh -huh but we don't really know what death is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's a nice yeah. perspective. So yeah. a lot of our attitudes toward death, is, I, I worried when I was even doing mine that 
it may have been like structured learning from having had a religious upbringing mm -hmm. or whatever, sure. you know, rather than my true feeling. Yeah. That's neat that you can even question that. I mm -hmm. think that's important because we are robotic to, you know, belief systems that were put in us. But that question that you just asked, what are your feelings about? Well, I was confused about your use of reconcile. How, whether that had a standard meaning to you or, you know, I just always go, reconcile. It's easier to reconcile with grief than with death. And my well, impression is that she said, no, right. death. She said right. the other way. Reconcile with death rather than grief. That's my subjective opinion, that sometimes it's easier to have to um, accept death than grief. Oh, OK. Yeah, because grief is, is kind of an odd emotion. It lives below the radar. I mean, if you talk to people who are really grieving, it's like, God, I locked myself out of my car, my house, three times today or two times today. I start bawling in the grocery store. It's like I've lost control, you know? I'm so sorry, I misheard you because oh. I, I had the opposite. When you said it, I thought, hmm, that's the opposite of what I heard. And, uh, I'm glad that so. we, you know, I'm glad we identified it. <laughs> Mary, what I would like to add is thanks to Living Art for helping people explore this and to hospice for helping people explore this. But by and large, we're uncomfortable with uncomfortable feelings, and grief is really uncomfortable. Yeah, that's so true. It's really an uncomfortable feeling. You don't, what do you do with it? What do you put it? There's no structure to it. You don't know how to deal with it what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. That's, other cultures, how do you do it right? Other cultures exactly. seem to have do ways of, do it enough? of dealing with both death and grief. I was thinking of um, my stepdaughter's African dance the other night. I mean, dancing and music just becomes part of this process. And like the Navajo is doing the sand paintings around the child that's dying, um, that somehow we just have pushed it away as far as we possibly can. We don't celebrate it like mm -hmm. so many other cultures do and accept it as part of life. Right. I wouldn't say we don't have rituals. I mean, when you think, of, say, when Princess Diana died, all of those flowers, mm -hmm. or, you know, a child dying on a bike, and then the next day you see all these flowers or streamers mm -hmm. where the accident occurred. And I mean, there are some grieving rituals. And I wonder if in cultures that do have Traditions, traditional ways of, of marking death and other passages. Is there room for individual expression? You know, like, is there a wake and mm -hmm. you got to get it done during the wake and, right. and you're, you're free to drink and, and do whatever you need to during the wake, but then that's it? Or you got to wear black for a year? Or, you know, <laughs> you can't have sex for yeah. two years? Or, you know, what? Is that a, is that enough for the for the members of that culture, or are there individuals who go, I just want to do it this way. <laughs> Can't I do it this way? <laughs> they run those ones out. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know. And just going back to the uh, the grief thing as well. I I think sometimes it can be really difficult when you know you yourself are grieving the loss of someone or, or wanting to try and explore that and other people around you can be quite uncomfortable because they don't know what to do with your emotions and so they'll either totally ignore it and not bring it up and then you're really uncomfortable <laughs> or you know I mean there's different degrees of that but this is what I think is so wonderful about uh, the kind of things that you're doing because I think I think part of you know, a big part of being able to use art and the creative process is not only because it can it dip into our unconscious and help us see a little bit more what we feel and think, 
It can also be a kind of cushion in a way. Uh, initially, I think just mm. a cushion, just in the sense that we we have that freedom, and it's something that we can externalize without fully knowing until we kind of see it in a way. You know, a bit like I don't know if I'm explaining that very well because I don't. Um, I like the word cushion. No, no, yeah, cushion's the wrong word. I, no, is I, that the wrong word? No, I like your yeah, word. You, yeah, <laughs> I, I just it on your belly. Yeah. No, it's just kind of you know, for myself, if we use different things like this, it just it makes it a little bit safer in a way because I don't know exactly what I'm digging into and then I've got something concrete that I can also make beautiful in some way as well as, you know, as well as being able to touch something deeper and try and see what's going on. Um, yeah, it's, it, I, can hold, I can embrace it a little more because it's, it's here. It's contained. Yes, yeah. there you go. That's really nice, yeah. Because yeah. grief is not contained, it's all over no. the map. It's like, gosh, that, that's well, the weird I, thing. I don't know if it contains actually quite the right word, because I was thinking in a way more that you can uh, you can also ex explore it a bit more, but it's out here a little. Right, right. No, yeah, no, no. It's external, right? Yeah. Inside. It doesn't hurt as much to explore it? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not sure if that's right. I know I have to think about that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> also, another, another ritual now is with social media people trying to figure out what to do with their loved ones' websites or uh, Facebook pages uh, and mm -hmm. how to create a memorial where people can visit and note and, and cyberspace. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cyberspace memorials. Yeah. I've never heard of it. Oh, yes. This is, and it's also a legal challenge because mm. um, and even some wills are now incorporating the right of the heirs to control the social media because otherwise the person's website lives on in perpetuity and sometimes the family doesn't want that. But they don't have the right to go and take it down. Huh. Wow. Interesting. Well, I'm really glad that we were able to have another conversation. Uh, Marika, what's next month? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Steve Darby? Okay. Tea Garden? No, Steve Darby. Oh. He's an attorney and he'll be talking about <coughs> like living wills, advanced directives, you know, sort of organizing oh, yourself okay. around end of life and what documents you need to do and the resources in our community. And um, he'll share his experience with that as well. Would he be able to address this business of the electronic? It's such a good yeah. question. I'll be sure to write that down to ask because I did not. I'm not ever. I'm a person who lives in that world a good portion of my day, and I have never thought of that. So we'll ask him for sure. The, the social, social media. Social media. media. Yeah, we'll ask him ahead of time so he has the heads up. And if not, okay. I have another question that came up in our support group, our caregiver support group, um, was. Um, how do I say this? Uh, combined assets? Oh, yeah. Uh, combined assets. Is it, we were curious whether, um, you know, the, the, a married couple must extend all their assets to the care of the ill person, which often leaves the survivor destitute. Mm -hmm. And we were curious whether and an individual's pension is also considered funds that need to be supportive of the spouse when medical bills are high, or whether those are considered the personal asset. Is a pension a personal asset, or is it a, collect a marital asset? Uh -huh. That's a great Evidently, uh, lawyers are, or judges are turning down divorces in light of these serious illnesses. They see a serious illness, and they don't grant the divorce. Because wow. they do, they see it as a way of cordoning off the assets. What's oh, wrong right. with that? <laughs> Can I put just a little plug in and announcement? Um, sure. April sixteenth is National Healthcare Decisions Day, and it's around having the conversation, having the advanced directive, having and, and medical advocates and compassion and choices has combined with the Missoula Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. Wow. Steve Darty is a board member and a state planning attorney, and we're having, it's called Willapalooza, 
<laughs> April 16th at the Children's Theater, and it's information about planning we'll ahead see. and getting stuff in writing and okay. informing the people in your lives of your choices. So, Amy, maybe you can take that question back, too, because that seems to be a question that's starting to surface quite a bit. People that have been in long-term caregiving, two, three, four, five, eight, ten years, and all of a sudden it looks like every bit of their assets are in. And Amy, is that an evening type of thing or an afternoon? It's, I believe, five to eight. April 16th. And I'll get a flyer to the March. Wonderful. Thanks for letting us know about that. There's a caregiving group uh, every Wednesday at the Village Senior Residence, and there's also a grief group starting March 3rd, right, Mindy? First. First. Or third. March 1st is a Saturday. Uh, March April. Is a Monday. April, I'm sorry. April 1st. April 1st. At the Ronald McDonald, it's free group. You're welcome to come no matter what stage you are in loss. Call Hospice in Missoula, find out about it. Um, and then the caregiving group is really great because we have an educational piece and then we talk. So really important. And if we do, one thing if you take away from expressive therapies today, it's not about art, even though we call it expressive arts, because <laughs> usually I terrorize people like, would you scribble draw that? Yeah, right. And they, I can hear them holding their breath, their heart going, you know, my first grade teacher told me I could never draw, hang it up. Yeah. But, it's expressive. It's about scribbling. It's about the first thing that comes to your head. So it's not about art. It's not about art. It's about the unconscious, connecting the unconscious with the conscious. So, anyways, thank you for coming. Thank you, Marika and Mindy. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.